Hi, I'm Moxie, and this is Mike from Tiny Bill Studios. Hello. Hello. <laughs> um, so, I'm going to ask you a few questions yes. based around sort of Tiny Bill the beginning, mm. where you kind of see yourselves in the next sort of five to ten years. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, a bit about your work ethics, you know, things like workflow, how you kind of do your day to day stuff, sure. and a few additional questions that you don't have to answer, but it'd be out of interest, really. Oh, wow, okay. <laughs> I'll put myself up for those ones. <laughs> so, um, tell me about the beginning of Tiny Build. Okay, so Tiny Build started in 2011, uh, and it was uh, this guy called Tom Bryan, who was from Manchester as well. And he um, he was making a game called No Time to Explain, uh, and it was just a, a like a little flash game. Uh, and it was this game. I don't know if you know much about No Time to Explain, but it's yeah. this game, you know, where you the mechanic is that it's a platformer where the the main weapon, your your kind of jetpack thing, this rocket thing, is also a jetpack. So you're not just like shooting things with it; you're also shooting at the ground to to blast yourself up. So he was making a small version of this, like a, just a flash game. And uh, Alex, who was like the CEO of Tiny Build, um, he was at a company called Spill Games at the time, which was doing like browser game. Uh, he was very much like a, a business guy at Spill Games, and um, he he saw No Time to Explain um, and was a bit like, "Wow, this is this is cool. Uh, this they should he should turn this into a proper thing." So he talked to Tom about it, and the two of them decide to try and make this into a, a big thing. And at some point they decide to call themselves Tiny Build just so they've got a name. Um, yeah. They're called Tiny Build because that's what Tom was called at school. Uh, <laughs> people called him that. I guess maybe when they saw him in the changing rooms or something. Um, <laughs> I'm talking about his, his physique rather than anywhere else. But, uh, <laughs> oh dear, he's going to hate me for that. But anyway, so um, so yeah, they so they started building No Time to Explain. Yeah. And uh, they, they didn't really have any money. So once they built a portion of the game, they went on Kickstarter, and this was uh, kind of like pre Double Fine. Uh, so they made like fifteen grand or something like that, which was big at the time. Like it was, it was one of the first like successful Kickstarters until Double Fine came along and kind of redefined what successful was. <laughs> um, but uh, so, so what also happened? There was some weird, awful crap that happened at the same time where uh, a Russian publisher. Uh, while the Kickstarter was going on, said, "Hey, we can, we want to get involved with this. We're going to throw a bunch of money at you." Um, and, and the guys were like, you know, they were like, "Oh yeah, okay, cool." So uh, they had this chunk of money now, and they started promptly making the game. And they're about halfway through making a game, and then the publisher just drops out and just doesn't give them money, um, and they were kind of screwed. Like they all of a sudden they had still like half the game to make. Yeah. And they had no money anymore. So, um, so the the only thing they could think of doing was releasing the game in episodes and just having like an episode one and episode two. So they released episode one. Uh, it wasn't on Steam or anything because that was also part of the the publishing thing that they'd get on Steam. Yeah. So they couldn't get on Steam anymore. Uh, and back then there was no green light, so yeah. you were just screwed basically. Um, so they they just released the game. It did okay, and they made them enough money that they could make part two. They could make episode two. So they made episode two and released that, and no one gave a shit because the game was already out, like yeah. in the eyes of like the press and, and whoever. So there was no extra sales from part two coming out. So now they had no money, and that was it. It was just done. Um, so uh, the two of them then kind of like, like, oh well, we're screwed, and time sort of died, and that was it. Um, and then uh, like months and months later, this must have been. 2012, I guess. Um, like Greenlight came out, uh, and Alex heard about Greenlight and was like, "I think maybe we should just stick No Time to Explain on it." So he puts No Time on, uh, and it got a shitload of votes, and they got through in the first like first batch of Greenlight. Um, and uh, so then um, they were both kind of super depressed, like at how crap everything had gone. But Alex is a bit like Tom. Let's just Let's just patch this thing together, just stick parts one and two together and just bung it on Steam. Uh, so they did that. And the game sold loads. <laughs> like, it did really well. And they were like, oh, crap. Like, and the thing is, the game was like super broken as well because when they had to go and put it on Steam and do like Steam integration and all this kind of stuff, loads of stuff was broken in the game. Um, so it got kind of like destroyed in, in reviews. 
uh, but people like learning, and this is when like YouTube has started becoming a big thing. Yeah. And all these big people like Markiplier and people like that started making videos of the game. Yeah. And like loving it, and so sure those people bought the game. So all of a sudden, the two of them are like, crap, like it's, it's, it's done well now. I don't know what we meant to do now. We're like, this the man's just disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> like we've stopped making games now, and all of a sudden we got this money. Um, and then. Uh, Alex, I, I can't remember where he was at, it was maybe some of that casual connect or something. He, um, he, he saw a game there called Speedrunner HD. Um, and I mean, so the, I guess the, the history of Speedrunners is that it was a Flash game, like a single player Flash game, and then it was an Xbox Live Indie game. Uh, very, very simple version of what Speedrunners is now, uh, which is local multiplayer. And, um, and the devs actually, I was talking to them about when I wrote about video games, um, the Double Dutch team. Uh, I remember emailing back and forth with them, like saying, because uh, back then I was on IndieGames.com and I used to just back and forth with devs all the time. And I was just, I remember saying to them, like, guys, this game, you need to work out how to get online multiplayer in it and stick it on PC. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. they were like, yeah, yeah, we, we probably do need to do that. And so they were like sending me, like, but this is like years ago, they were sending me like beta versions of like the, or the online. I was like one of the first batch of people to be, to be testing this with them. Um, so he, he saw uh, this kind of bill that they were trying to do at a show, and he was like, hey, like, I have a shitload of money right now, like, do you want me to help you out? <laughs> and, and so then Tom then came, they, they joined together, Tom came on board with with the game to be like the kind of art director on it, yeah. um, and Alex was like the guy like funding it and, and doing all the business side of it, and the Double Dutch team continued to just like do the coding and make the game. And uh, then Speedrunners comes out and does amazing. Yeah. Like, obviously, it's nearly sold like a million copies now or something. Yeah. And I guess for Alex, it was always like um, the, the publisher who had screwed them over in the first place. That was still quite a sore point. And so he was a bit like, we could probably do it better. Like, we have, we have so much money now. We could probably, like, use this influence that we have now to start helping other people. Yeah. So then, since like 2013, they started off slow. Published like one game in 2013, and then like four games last year. And this year, this year it's been like a dozen. I, I don't even know. It's been loads this year since I joined. But um, yeah, they've they've basically been trying to, I guess, the the experience they had with that publisher, just try to better it and yeah. actually do something. Because the publisher really. that they wished they had. Exactly, yeah. yeah. They hadn't been screwed over. This is what they would have liked to have happened with their game. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, that's kind of been it since then. They, you know, I joined last year. I've been... Um, I, well, I, I, I feel like the people have been saying to me over and over again, like this year, like, holy shit, where did Tiny Bill come from? Like, <laughs> just all of a sudden I've heard of these guys and I, I keep hearing about them over and over again. Um, that's because we just don't shut up, and we're just, we're at every, every single show we're here, like at EGX now, the, the resed area looks like it's the tiny build area, <laughs> it's got this giant banner of, it's got so many games there, the res people are like, do you just, do you just want a banner? <laughs> we'll, just, we'll just put a banner over your games, which I don't know how the other like publishers around us feel about that, but um, yeah, this has very much been the explosion year for tiny build. Um, but then there has been a, an explosion generally for indie games. Yeah. Totally. Oh yeah. Hey, and I think that's pro and, I, and it's not a coincidence that Tiny Bill and other people like Team Seventeen and Ripstone etc. You all of a sudden started hearing their names again. Yeah. Because the problem now is that if you just release a game and you haven't built up any, you've not managed to get any talk about it. There's no one caring about it. There's, there's not a big buzz. Yeah. Then you're going to get screwed when you release a game. Now. Absolutely. It's just, it's, it's an awful time, and you're even seeing, you see the stories of like, like big name people, like, I'm not going to say names, it's fucking horrible, but there's like, big names now who are releasing games, and then, you know, especially because of Steam Spy now, you can like see just bare, like, how many copies people are selling, and, and there's people who are struggling, like, who yeah. have so much experience, and yet they're struggling too, so if those people are struggling, What's the chance that if someone who's, who's it's their first game, they have no like social media presence? Absolutely. No one knows their game. They're screwed, and and I think that's that's part of it, right? If Tiny Bill pick up a game, 
then people are going to hear about it. Absolutely. Because we already have the influence, we already have like the tens of thousands of people following us. We, we can take it to shows, we can get it out there. So, you know, people are like, oh, I've seen some people being very skeptical of all these smaller publishers, like, oh, they take a cut and, you know, and they don't have to do anything in exchange. But it's like, no, actually, we do shitloads. <laughs> work my balls off for these people. Because the thing is, we only sign games that we give a shit about. Yeah. There's been so many, like, plot parts where a, a quite a, like a, a fairly well-known dev has come to us and talks to us. This has happened over and over again. Like, we're someone where I'm like, man, imagine if we were working with them. Yeah. But the problem is, like, I'm trying this, like, game that they're kind of currently got in development. And I, and I just don't... Feel, or uh, it's not maybe it's not just that I don't feel it, or maybe I don't feel like it's a tiny build game. Yeah, but then there's there is a time and place where there is going to be yeah. a game that's tiny build game and not tiny build game. Yeah, and it's just being able to be true to yourself and obviously the brand. Yeah, and saying this is a good game, it's just not for us. And well, that happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. and it, and so when we sign games because we actually. Really, like I don't, I don't just want to like, oh, just churn them out and whatever. Like, we'll <laughs> spit them out and do the next one. There's absolutely no what it is. Because I keep hearing as well, like, oh, if there isn't like heavy investment in a game from a publisher, then there's no risk for them. So why do they care? Like they're not going to care that much. They can just churn it out, and there's no risk to them. So then we can get rid of it. Yeah. But like, hopefully, people see from the launches of our games that we can balls to the wall on this. <laughs> like we go absolutely crazy. Um, trying to, you know, trying to make sure that it gets the attention. Gets oh yeah, yeah. like and when the game's out, then we do not stop. Like, what latest one I guess was like Party Hard, like a few weeks ago, and just since that has happened, we've just constantly had Twitch on, just all the time. Like we're at we're at PAX, yeah. and just always PAX PAX is going on around us, and we've got like our iPads out, like watching str like Twitch streams of people streaming Party Hard because we care about this shit. Yeah. We want these games to do well, Absolutely. and yeah. so. Yeah, we just, it's its kind of important, I guess, to, to be able to, um, to be able to do this for, for people who, especially like if it's someone's first game, then you need to, cause I, I've seen so many devs, like, they release a game, and it doesn't go anywhere, and that's it, and they just give up, they disappear, or whatever, yeah. and they get depressed, and I, I'd do that. If I, if I was releasing a game now, uh, and, and actually, I, I, I kind of want to actually, I've been talking to my brother about getting back into development because that's what I used to like, do at uni, and if I was releasing a game now, there is no way I would not go with it right now. I would not, even like, even someone like me who has like a tiny bit of influence at least, com especially compared to someone who's new, I would 100% go with like one of these smaller publishers, because you need the backing of that. Absolutely, and there's also the risk factor as well, because if you take on board a publisher who has this connection, who has that ability, the risk is not entirely on your shoulders. Mm -hmm. and they, these publishers are taking a risk by taking your game and actually doing something with it. Yeah, exactly, because so, if, it, if it tanks, then you can be like, hey look, my game tanked when I went with this publisher, and that's bad for them. Yeah. Like, if, if that happens to us, if we like released a game and it did shit, yeah. and then we wouldn't be able to stop, like, we wouldn't be able to say to publish it. By the way, don't tell anybody that it went wrong, okay? <laughs> don't do that. So they'd be able to just talk about that. Yeah. So it, there is risk for us. We, it's our reputation on the line. Absolutely. Yeah. So. But that's why, again, you have to take that real careful look at the games and say, is this a tiny little game? Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I was actually, my, my next question was going to be what's next, but kind of set feel, I get the gist that you're kind of moving down the publisher route more than the development route. Yeah, yeah. Do you feel that Tiny Bill's ever going to be self-publishing again, or do you think they're, or do you think they're going to be doing something? You know, we, we've talked so much, and we've actually been prototyping um, some like some stuff we want to develop. At, at one point, we were um, we were talking about just being really silly and just like putting some like free games out on Steam, just like making kind of like half an hour things where. They were kind of, I guess, acting as like adverts for our game. Not, not like an advert, but more like if we if we put out a short like half an hour games that were developed by us, it was just free on Steam. Yeah. People could download them, enjoy themselves, and be like, oh, okay, cool. Tiny Build made a cool game. I'll go check out some of their Why don't you ever consider doing a Tiny Build sort of like um, game game jam? Yeah, we talked about that stuff as well. I especially I talked about like sponsoring game jams like in Manchester. 
I think that we're probably going to look into that, uh, that kind of thing. Because uh, that would be probably the best way to do it. Because if you have sure. small teams of people doing small little games, yeah, of course, yeah. then you can make it free, and it's essentially you can have it on your website and everywhere else. Yeah. And there you go. Um, okay, so moving on then. So, uh, <clears throat> when you sort of made a transition, mm. what was the kind of reaction? Um, with regards to you as an individual, because of course you've made that transition from you know, writing about it to working in it. So what was that like for you? How, you know, was that just a chance coincident meeting, or did you work very hard initially and get into it? So uh, the way it happened was, so I was I was a gun sutra um, in well last year, and uh, I'd gone to. Um, I've gone to talk at DevGam, uh, which is a like an Eastern European conference, which is just fucking great. Like, it's, it's difficult to get to because you need kind of visas and all that kind of stuff uh, for like Russia and, and Belarus. But it's such a nice conference, um, and uh, basically, I, um, I I was a speaker there because I do a lot of speaking stuff because I can talk my mouth off, and. Um, uh, I uh, I, <laughs> I got drunk in a warehouse uh, at a unity party. It's just this abandoned warehouse. It was such a weird party. <laughs> and I was talking to Alex and Tiny World, um, like, and I and I guess I'd been writing about games for so long that I was I was getting a bit disillusioned by it. Um, especially like I, so like months before I'd um, forgotten I'd been covering like the rise of YouTube, and I was like. The only person doing this. I think Simon Parkin did it as well. Uh, but Simon Parkin is just a genius and does everything. So whatever, I don't mind if he's doing it as well. And um, the um, and I remember I, I did an article um, that basically kind of spelled out that like the press don't matter anymore like that yeah. much, and YouTubers are massive and Twitch streamers and and when I like and when it went up, it was being shared loads by like people writing about games, and they're all like taking the piss, like oh this is oh yeah, oh yeah we're all gonna die, aren't we? All this kind of stuff. Um, and I think since the article like went out, I think like four major sites have actually tanked. Yeah, like, they have. People yeah. like joystick and people like that. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was so wrong. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but like I, I remember at the part the time when I pulled that out, just being like, oh, look at this reaction. Like these people who they're having to they're having to churn out shitty press release news every day yeah. just to like make ends meet on a website which is probably being funded elsewhere anyway by something that isn't this um, they, it, there was just so much like denial about what was going on yeah and then especially after like the gamergate stuff started happening and that was just all through so, um, <laughs> I wasn't, and the thing is, I, I loved all the people at Gamma as well. That was, that was the big like heartbreaker for me. Like uh, people like this guy called Simon Carlos, who had basically like found me like eight years before and asked me to do IndieGames.com, and he had been amazing to me like the whole time. Like actually giving me incredible opportunities, thinking about me all the way. So it was it was really hard to like leave that place, um, and I'm still like amazing good friends with them. Uh, but it was just it was just a combination of like awfulness that when then I'm in this abandoned warehouse and I'm a little bit drunk and Alex says to me, Hey, you know, we're we're kinda of looking for someone who knows how to kind of do all this stuff and kind of knows knows indie developers and can help us find games. And my brain was immediately like <laughs> <laughs> and it was like I was just really casually like, Yeah, I can do that, yeah. And then a few days later I'm like, So by the way, that thing we were talking about um, so yeah, it happened. It was very spontaneous, um, but it but it had it had been months before that when I'd been a bit down. But then they do bit. say, you know, one door closes, another one opens. Well, yeah, exactly. And and since I started doing this, it's, it's been amazing. Like it's been so much nicer. I don't want to write about video games ever again. <laughs> it's, it's been incredible. And they, and it's like there's a lot of like filling in the blanks as well, you know, like it's like I had a jigsaw puzzle and I was missing some of the pieces and now like there were pretty fucking important pieces of the picture that I'm like, oh it's a donkey! Uh, you know, like, <laughs> just like filling in the pictures, so, so uh, yeah. You can't make that game though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could do, yeah. A tiny donkey. But um, yeah, it was, it was, it's just been nice and, um, and it's, and it's just been so cool, like some of the things I get to do now as well. You know, the, yeah. And and as well because I because I wrote about games for so long, I just know what people who are writing about games just want now, so I can just get them straight to it. Yeah. Like, people are interviewing me, 
and they're like, they start, yeah, I can see, like, especially some of the like more inexperienced people, are, like, putting that question, like, about them. I'm thinking, they're thinking, I'm just like, do you want me to tell you about this? Do you want me to tell you about that? I'm just like, just going, I'd ask about this, so I'll tell you about this. <laughs> so, um, there, there is, um, I have noticed a lot of people walking around with their little mics and stuff and things, so they ah, I could do that, but I never do that. <laughs> Uh, no, it's weird sometimes. So yeah, some of the <laughs> some of the people like sitting down chatting to you, you get the same questions all the time. You know, so, like, what's the game about? How many levels does it have? <laughs> Those kind of stuff. But you can get that at a press release in an email. So why do you need yeah. to ask that again? Yeah, I guess as well. Like, I'm being a bit unfair because when I wrote it at Garma, it was like a business website, right? So we were. I, I was forced to think of interesting questions because we didn't want the consumer answers, we wanted the, the design questions, you know, like, how did you decide to make that thing in the game just like that? <laughs> so then when people come up to me and ask me mundane questions, my brain just goes, <laughs> jeez. I've just, I've started taking the mic a little bit, to be honest, like, they don't, they don't realise I'm doing it, but the answers I'm giving are so terrible that they just, they don't realise I'm doing it, so, it's a little bit, it's become a bit of a game for me, to be honest, like, when people ask me questions, there was a guy uh, that I talked to yesterday who, like, he didn't, like, I explained I was the publisher on the game, but he didn't really understand and he thought I made the game, like, uh, the Watch Club game, and I didn't really want to explain it to him again, so I just pretended I was the developer for 15 minutes, and I got away with it, actually, <laughs> I was pretty good, <laughs> he was like, what's it made in, oh, I made it in Unity, <laughs> Wow, who's your artist? Oh, I, I tried to explain it to you, but his name's Russian, so it's really hard to pronounce. <laughs> just, so, just duck, good. duck the question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been pretty That's good fun, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, so, in regards to the show at the moment, yeah. so, coming up to the end of the, the sort of conversation, I suppose, yeah. um, has there been any sort of game or development team that's really piqued your interest outside of the tiny girl? Arena, yeah. Um, that you've sort of take note of, and that you you'd like to sort of mention, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I've got to try and like be really sneaky, sneaky in case there's anything I want to publish, and I don't want to, you know, give anything away. I mean, the game that a lot of people are talking about is Thumper. Uh, I don't know if you've seen uh, that. Yes. Yeah, yes. everyone's talking about Thumper. Everyone's talking about Thumper. Yeah, and I need to go and talk to those guys. But um, oh, you'd, you'd have a real trouble too, because they're not in this country. Well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> runs the left field, David Haywood, I, I know him pretty well, so and he mentioned it before, but I hadn't actually like gone and checked it out, so I need to do that. Yes, um, I've been told eight times yes. to go and play it. Mm -hmm. not, Wait, have you played it? Not yet, no! Oh, go play it. It's, uh, it. it's very interesting, it's like a, um, how do you describe it? God, it's, uh, I guess it's a, a rhythm game. Yes, um, I've been told. It's, it's fucking dark. Like, yes? It's, yeah. And it's like, and you know, uh, it's like a traveling down a track thing, but there's only one track. So at the first you're like, what the hell? Like, what is the game? I don't understand. I'm just, the linear in this. Yeah, like you press it, you press it left and right, and, the, and it's kind of bouncing against the walls. And then you press A, you press like an A, I think, and the, and the wings come up, and you're like, what the hell is this? I don't even understand. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, you're like, <laughs> Christ. <laughs> Yeah, I do need to, because um, I've been told that one and the friend's puppet one at the end, which is Alex Johansson's Oh yeah, yeah, game. and this And there's things like, um, oh, the left field's so amazing. I, I, I got a, I've been getting a taxi every morning with um, some just uh, some people who are, I guess, just some couture people who are coming to see it, because they're in the same hotel as us and we live miles away. And um, I, like, this morning, uh, the guy was like to me, like, oh, we've not been in the left field area yet because it looks a bit like bland and, and awful. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? It's just like, no, it looks like that because. They don't have but, the money to advertise yeah, their Exactly. Games. I'm just like, don't, no, don't do that. No, just go to the left field area. It's yeah. amazing. There's so many amazing things. I managed to convince him. So it is sad that, like, because there's not a lot we can do about it, right? No. Like, that's, and the rest area looks like it does because loads like, of people paid a bunch of money. So, yeah. um, which I guess is. Consumerism at its finest, but um, yeah, it's. I don't know. It, it, it'll be nice to be able to shout about the left field era a bit more and try and like push some people in it. Um, yeah, definitely. I every time I write about EGX and left and res, my one thing is to always stay. Go to the left field collection. Yeah. Even if it's the first day you're here. Yeah. Just go because you've got plenty of time to go and queue somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or just at the start of the day, just go and run and just stand in the queue for an hour for the division. I don't care. You'll see a 10 minute demo where it's hands off and some guy will shout at you and then give you a badge or something and then, then go to the left field area and you just spend the rest of the day there. And you play how many games? Like 20, 20 odd games in yeah. a row, yeah, exactly. no queues, yeah. no downtime and yeah. all unique creative games. Exactly. And they were all, you know, they were, they were picked for it as well, you know, someone actually went, hey, this is good, you should probably show this. <laughs> yeah. Instead of someone paying like tens, hundreds of thousands of dollars to have a giant box in a place where you've been a high fighter. Yeah. Just taking up space because they got nothing bad to spend their money on, really. Yeah. I mean, the, I, I'll tell you what, um, Star Fox, I like Star Fox. Played that to yeah. talk about some non-indie stuff. Yeah, I, I went and played Star Fox this morning, and I'm a giant like Lila Wars fan. Yes. Um, I so uh, I liked it. It was it felt a little bit slow. Yes. I don't know if they made it slow just for the show build, and maybe it's faster when I you play it. I think it's slower because you've got to use a gyro on oh, the. God, I'm gonna turn that off immediately. Yes. God, I don't know why they do that. I was playing Splatoon on it yesterday because I had to do this tournament thing. I had to play it with the, the gyro. It was awful. Why do they keep forcing that crap on me? Because I, otherwise I they've got sticks. no USP on it. I don't care. Just get, I just want to play with the sticks. <laughs> Jesus. I'll tell you what was cool though. Um, I was playing it. I was playing it on the end, and there was the they had the second screen next to it, which was the which the, was the, the touch the pad. pad. Yeah. That was awesome. Yeah. I was actually like, man, it's like I can I could because I could look on here and I can like I can kind of work out where I'm going. I I was playing the one where you're like chasing pigment. And so I had it on, like, I pressed the button to go into target mode, so it was like following Pingma on the screen. Yes. And then I had the cockpit there. Yes. So I could kind of work how I was going and then be like, yeah, go for him, go for him, like that. If Forget I could play, you could just look down. Yeah, do it there. if I could just smash the screen, if I could, if I could connect the screen, the, <laughs> and you must be able to, right? Because they've yeah. done it. If I, if I could, like, officially connect the screen of my, Wii, of my Wii game panel, so I could have a second screen, I would play like that. That would be or you'd have like one on top of the other, maybe just ahead of you. Yeah, yeah I can't play like that. That's not a thing. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, can go, I can play like that. I can't play like well, that. Well, did they do that to the DS? Did they have it separate from... No, they had it two together, yeah. one on top of the other. I mean, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree with maybe that's what. Maybe that's what they need. Maybe yeah. they just need a connector so you can connect that screen up to a second TV. Yeah. I mean, no one would use it, but I would. Oh, probably and probably that's probably. all that matters, really. So. But no, I'm, I'm the guy that likes to have the three screens to get the full immersion as well. So. I, I, I work with two screens, so for me, looking at two screens is nothing. That's just normal. Yeah. So I'm like playing it like this. It was, it was just incredible, like to just have the cockpit there, you know, because you've got like the the aiming with the tilting, and that was yeah. annoying. But I'd, I'd rather just stick. But but I was kind of aiming, and, and I, I could see that I'm following on the screen, you know, like kind of cinematic style following. Him. Yeah. And then he appears on this screen, and I'm like, I'm like, it's like Battlestar Galactica style or something. It was amazing. <laughs> so yeah, they should do that if Nintendo's listening, which of course they never are. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, if you uh, had to give any advice to any inspiring um, indie dev, yes, as to the kind of structure, or the beginnings, and just to give us advice to get them on their way, what would it be? Uh, it would be to start off small and plan on failing a lot, because the chance that your first game is going to make you a million dollars is. It's not even slim, it's like virtually impossible, especially now. So if you were starting out making games, or maybe you making them for a little while and you're just thinking of making some commercial, you need to not be thinking. Like my brother, he the first thing that he tried to do was make like a 30 hour RPG. And he spent like a year on it or something, making this this terrible thing, because he, he couldn't code or anything like that. But, you know, he was he was